Welcome. Welcome. And thank you for waiting. I'm Jordan Kelman. I'm Dean of Liberal Arts here at UL Lafayette. It is a great honor and pleasure to open this colloquium. Of all the many uh, happy events that we have at the university and positive things that we do in this community, it is rare to have an event that is so exciting and so promising and so good for the initiatives that we are undertaking as a group, together, as a community, for moving our area forward, for moving our state forward. We're here today to uh, celebrate the legacy of the amazing career in public service of Governor Kathleen Babineau Blanco, and also to celebrate the opening uh, and the launch of the uh, Kathleen Babineau Blanco Public Policy Center here at the university. It comes at a propitious moment. Uh, we are at a turning point in our political lives and in our civic lives. Uh, the paradox of this moment is that we have tremendous new resources for understanding the complex human problems that our society faces, for understanding which solutions work to move our society forward and which don't. We have an ability to gather data and analyze data and draw conclusions from it that we didn't even have five years ago, much less 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and yet, at the same time, we have public policy decisions that are often appear to be being made in a data vacuum where ideology and politics can often trump information and truth and progress. Um, the Kathleen Blanco Public Policy Center stands for the principle that we can solve that problem. It brings not only the resources of public policy analysis, but the archives of Governor Blanco's term uh, in office, which she has graciously donated to the university, which form a very, very rich archive for us to begin to understand recent Louisiana history, the problems that we've faced, the solutions that we've come up with, and to begin to understand how progress is made through the thicket of negotiations that political action inevitably takes. Today's panel will be addressing all of these deep issues in many ways that you'll hear more about. Before we begin, I'd like to thank a few people. First of all, the development office and Pilar Ebley in particular, all of whom uh, on the development office staff have been crucial in moving this project forward. Dupre Library, in particular, Charlie Treesh, Susan Richard, and Zach Stein, all of whom have been integral to uh, getting this off the ground. And Sally Donlan, Assistant Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, without whom this whole colloquium would not have come to be. We actually have amongst us today two towering figures of public service in Louisiana and US government. Um, and in fact, if you're talking about women figures in public service in Louisiana and US government, you might say the two towering figures. Uh, I'd like to first say a word about uh, Governor Kathleen Babineau Blanco. Um, for some of you may not be familiar with some of her history and accomplishments. She's actually from this area, from New Iberia. She holds a bachelor's degree in business education from UL Lafayette. She was the first woman elected to the Public Service Commission, and she served two terms as lieutenant governor. During that time, there was a $2.5 billion increase in, the tourism's, in tourism's economic contribution to the state and the creation of 21,000 new tourism-related jobs. 
In 2004, as you all know, she became Louisiana's first woman governor. During her term as governor, 35,000 jobs were created in the state and $24 billion in new investments in the state came in. She overhauled the juvenile justice system and vastly expanded insurance, uh, particularly for uh, youngsters. She chaired the Southern Regional Education Board and raised the standards for education, not only in Louisiana, but across the South. She actually instituted the system of contraflow that we all rely on during emergencies and that was a critical element in mitigating the disaster that was Hurricane Katrina. I can speak from personal appreciation because we used the contraflow system during our evacuation uh, during Hurricane Gustav, and I'm sure many of you have similar stories to tell. In total, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, she brought $4 billion in aid of various kinds to the state of Louisiana. It was an incredibly hard fought battle in many ways uh, against the odds and against resistance, but it was something that she fought because she believed and felt very strongly about it. She established a coastal protection, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority and led the fight to secure our state's wetlands, a fight that still continues with every mark of her, um, of her influence. So I'd like everybody to join me in congratulating Governor Kathleen Blanco on this incredible career and contribution to the state. She's also been instrumental. Uh, it was her idea, the Public Policy Center, and she's been instrumental in um, seeing it come into being. I'm happy now to uh, introduce our moderator today, who is another towering figure in Louisiana's history of public service and national public service, Senator Mary Landrieu. Senator Landrieu was the youngest woman ever elected to the Louisiana State Legislature at the age of 23. Let's think about that for a second. <laughs> she, uh, throughout her career uh, in public service, has focused on women and children, flood protection. She was instrumental um, in instigating education reform in that early role. She served two terms as state treasurer, uh, where she oversaw pension diver diversification, created the first ever mun municipal investment fund, which is now uh, valued at over $2 billion. As a US sen senator representing Louisiana, she was a member of the Armed Services Committee, the Appropriations Committee, and chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, extremely important committees for our area in particular. She passed the Small Business Jobs Act in 2010 and was responsible for the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, one of the most important um, acts uh, affecting the uh, oil industry and uh, oil issues in our region. Uh, she also uh, was instrumental in the Restore Act, the single largest one-term environmental investment in the Gulf Coast in America's entire history. I want to say something in general about both of these uh, amazing public servants, which is that reading through their biographies, one is struck that both of them shared a deep core belief in putting human beings and human progress above politics, in putting progress above uh, fighting, and putting the best interests of the people of the state of Louisiana and the people of the United States above all other interests. So together, I would say, they form an example that many, many in our country would do well to follow. So without further ado, 
Please take the floor, Mary Landrieu. Well, good morning, everyone, and what a wonderful turnout this morning to honor really an extraordinary woman, Governor Kathleen Babineau Blanco. Woman extraordinaire, political leader, civic leader, community leader, mother, grandmother, and I think great-grand? Not yet, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with this growing family of the Babineau Blancos, and it's one of the largest, so it's hard to keep up with, but soon to be great-grandmother. And I'm so honored to be asked to uh, moderate this extraordinary panel of individuals that have followed Governor's career, have been part of the helping of developing and making and building that career, uh, to give even a broader perspective, Dean, than you so eloquently uh, just shared with us. So it's really wonderful to be here. We have about an hour and 45 minutes to be together, and I think you're going to find it quite exciting. We're going to have a short presentation by each of our panelists who have been asked to sort of focus on a particular area of the governor's legacy, something that she and her family and all of us are proud of, and our state will literally benefit for generations to come. And uh, so it's going to be an exciting morning. And I'm already noticing that we either wore our Babineau Blanco blue or we wore our Cajun, you know, crazy Cajun red. So, so we're, we're ready to go. Um, and let me briefly introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, as I said, we would do it, um, I'm going to do the introductions all together. And then as I've, they're being, they're introduced, they'll start their presentations, either seated or standing. And we're also gonna have questions and comments, you know, as appropriate from the audience. And Governor, you can always speak, no matter when, you know, whatever. Yeah, you can interrupt, you, can, you, know, you can't filibuster, but other than that, <laughs> it, it will be uh, welcomed. Let me begin with uh, Kim Hunter-Reed, uh, who is uh, Dr. Reed, who is now serving as our Commissioner of Higher Education. Really an extraordinary career. We've, many of us have followed Kim uh, for years and years and watched her go to the highest levels. She served as Deputy Undersecretary at the U.S. Department of Education after serving in many positions here in state government. She also led the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. She's a Lake Charles native. She has a doctorate in pu public policy from Southern University, master's from Louisiana State University. Um, secondly, we will hear from Dr. Deanne uh, Kallick. She's a professor of sociology, head of the department here. She holds her doctorate from Louisiana State University, is an expert on many variety of family-related issues. But most importantly, I found that her research on outcomes of the first drug court model in a district right here in Lafayette served as the model for the entire state of Louisiana with drug courts, leading to really much more effective ways of dealing with um, men, women, boys, and girls uh, with addictions, et cetera. Sean Wilson, uh, Secretary Sean Wilson, Dr. Wilson, Secretary Wilson serves as Chief of Staff uh, for, D he served as Chief of Staff for DOTD for 10 years, now he's a Secretary himself. Now his, this is extraordinary in political life because he served for three, with three Secretaries and two Governors. It's hard to survive one <laughs> per term, okay? He's a survivor, three different terms, and I think Republicans and Democrats, which even makes it more interesting and, and um, uh, and a feather in his cap. He's a proud product of New Orleans Public Schools. He uh, earned a BA in Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Louisiana's Master's in Public Policy from Southern. Fourth, we have Dr. Christy Malloy, PhD and Professor of Political Science at UL, right here at UL. Uh, she earned her BA degree in Political Science from uh, Emory and Henry College in Virginia and from Texas A&M University. We will forgive you for that. Um, Thank you. Her focus is on civic education and civic engagement. Uh, she's an active member of the Lafayette League of Women Voters. Uh, and we'll talk, I hope, a lot about the pioneering spirit of Governor Blanco um, in the recent history of our state and country. And then finally, we have um, 
Dr. David Kay, um, who is uh, the Department of Criminal Justice at UL. He holds advanced degree in pharmacy and pharmaceutical scientist. Dr. Key also earned a doctorate in criminology. He's an expert on the reform of the juvenile justice system, and we'll talk um, about that when his term comes. And sixth, Terry Porsche Ricks, um, two decades of legal and financial human services policy management experience. She's currently the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Children and Family Services, something that I know has been close to Governor Blanco's heart for her whole entire time in public office. Um, Terry helps to shape Louisiana disaster recovery in the area of health and social services, and she has a great deal to share um, and is a graduate of the Council for Better Louisiana Cable Leadership, among many other graduates and degrees that she has behind her name. So we have a wonderful panel this morning chosen by the um, university here. So Kim, why don't we start um, with you, Dr. Reed, and they can stay seated or stand whatever they're comfortable, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here, Governor. It's so wonderful to see you. Um, I had the honor, of course, of working for Governor Blanco and so many issues, so I am excited to talk about her legacy of education and how we move that legacy forward. When I think about the intersection of her work and education, in Louisiana, in America, I think about the term against all odds. I remember when uh, we were working on inauguration and excited about seeing Louisiana's first female governor take that helm. Uh, there was an article that said previously that the lieutenant governor's seat was a poor launching pad to be governor, and it could not be done. And so many times she's had this conversation about it cannot be done, and yet she shrugged and said it will be done, and she moved it forward. And so I think this intersection, whether it's education or election, against all odds, is at the center of what I want to talk about. When the governor spoke and began her work, she said, education is poverty's mortal enemy. And as I think about my work today and the legacy of where we are, that truly is still the case. We have in America, in Louisiana, as you know, so many equity gaps that have to be addressed. And so when I think about the fact that talent has no zip code but opportunity does in America and Louisiana, what do we do to ensure that a student's race, their family background, and their geography does not determine their likelihood of success? She spoke to that, and we will continue that legacy of the work. Certainly, as I think about her educational legacy, I think about um, her commitment to continuing what works, because she would say to that to us, let's accelerate what works and let's um, double down on what else needs to be done. So when she saw the pre-K uh, LA-4 working, she continued to move that forward and expanded that. Uh, when she saw that we needed to have the teaching profession elevated as a former teacher, she moved that forward and ensured that teachers were paid at the SRB average for a long, before uh, something that hadn't been done in a long time. Higher education had not been funded at the SRB average in 30 years, she did that. And when Hurricane Katrina and Rita came, and the hurricane that was FEMA, she said that we will use this moment in time to rebuild stronger. And so over 100 schools in New Orleans were taken over, failing schools. And when we watched the news together with her after the hurricanes, and we saw children from Louisiana going to school for the first day, she said to me, those parents will come back better and those children will come back better because they will know what to ask for. They will have seen quality education somewhere else and they will not stop until they get quality education for their children. And so the recovery school district in New Orleans was part of her legacy as well. Juvenile justice reform, which I'm sure you will talk about, was something that I had a chance to work directly with her on. And then a state like Louisiana that has as much poverty as we have did not have a need-based aid program for our, high, for our higher education students. And so she created in her watch uh, the Louisiana Go Grant program, Louisiana's need-based aid program. Uh, you will see that in the South, there's been a history of merit-based aid for places that have the greatest poverty. Uh, it's been a political issue, and certainly there's a lot of support for TOPS. But it should not be an either or, it should be a both and. And so she recognized that and made sure that we had need-based aid 
for Louisiana students. So we build on that legacy of a governor who was an educator too, and a mom and a grandmom, and understood the foundation of education as poverty's mortal enemy. And so where do we go now? We obviously have to continue to advance good work when it comes to erasing equity gaps. The gaps still exist, and in some places they are larger. And we have to make sure that we're thinking deeply about this exercise of educating our students. So for me, as the new commissioner of higher ed, I know that I have to do more than say to students, college is great and you should join us. This is a human capital exercise for people in poverty. We have to think about what are the barriers to entry and to success? What are the social determinants of completion in higher education? And how do we step forward with that? Making sure that more students begin college in high school, uh, with dual enrollment, concurrent enrollment, that more students have access to quality teachers, to STEM teachers, that they understand that we believe in their unlimited potential. Each and every day, we have to make sure we're doing that, that we're preparing them well, and we are erasing equity gaps and belief gaps in uh, Louisiana in our schools. We also have to think about, as we sit in the, the Light Center, um, we also have to think about what does innovation mean for education, I think, in our state and in our nation. Knowledge transfer, what will it look like as we move forward in an age of automation and artificial intelligence? How do we skill build for people when we are creating uh, leaders uh, and putting graduating students into uh, the workforce where there are jobs that do not exist yet? How do we prepare students for jobs that do not exist? And how do we prepare for individuals to come back when their jobs move forward because of automation or, or move away and they have to be reskilled? How do we do that important work? So I think all of those things are very important. The continuum of education, how are we thinking about our smallest child all the way up to th through our lifelong learner? And how do we think about talent and talent development in a broader way in Louisiana I think is very important. Um, I always say I'm not really commissioner of higher education in Louisiana, I'm chief advocate for talent development in Louisiana. And when we think about talent in our state, we must think about traditional students and returning adults and veterans and opportunity youth and justice-involved individuals and foster youth uh, and all, or the full range of individuals who have talent that is yet to be fully formed. And when we think about college in Louisiana, we have to think about technical colleges and community colleges and four-year institutions so that a student's aptitude and interest determine where they're going, knowing that where they start is not where they will finish. But we have to make sure we understand that we cannot say to our students in this day and age that the four-year degree is the only measure of success. We have to make sure that there is honor in all pathways and that these credentials, this skill building, continues to move forward in our state. So I think all of that is important to the work. When I walk in my office at work, and I've been on the job three months, I look at a photo of my grandmother and Governor Blanco, two educators who have shaped my life, uh, who have been passionate about educating students, who have been uh, committed to the work that must be done, who understood that education was the passport to prosperity. And so I'm honored to be here to thank the governor for her legacy of leadership, for not listening to the naysayers and believing against all odds that she could do it. Uh, it's wonderful to see what a girl can do in Louisiana, everything. And so I thank her for this work, and I am committed to continuing to build on that legacy as we focus on erasing equity gaps and increasing talent development in Louisiana. Thank you. Perfect, Kim. We're going to have one or two questions or comments. Would you share with the group what you shared with us earlier about your very first job in Lake Charles? So, because there's students here, and it's kind of important, I think, to kind of really see that she just didn't pop out as the commissioner of administration. <laughs> sure. So, a couple of things. So, my actual very first job as a teenager was at the YMCA, teaching children who were afraid of swimming to swim. So that was a hard-earned $3.35 an hour. <laughs> my first campus job was as an RA, and I think there are some of us on this stage who've done that. My first state job was press secretary at 23 for Governor Edwin Edwards. So is
Isn't that amazing? Um, from swimming teacher to commissioner of education. And Governor Blanco, you helped make that path possible. <laughs> Questions or comments? Um, what struck me is when Kim said that the governor said education is the mortal enemy of poverty. And part of the institute here, I think Dean is really focused on that concept poverty transformation, economic advancement, strategies that work, which is, I think, at the heart of what the governor wants to uh, see us continue to work on. You know, it was Nelson Mandela that said, um, education is the only way, he said, to transform a society. So we have some amazing leaders in Nelson Mandela, in Governor Blanco, everyone, um, in between and, and connected with uh, groups of leaders like that. Any comments, questions about education, higher ed? To Kim, any? Yes, and please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Maribel Dietz. I'm a professor of history at LSU, actually. And um, my question is about funding higher education. Sure. And in the past decade or so, we have been up and down and <laughs> what can we do to, to really ensure that higher education is fully funded? Thank you so much for that uh, question and reminder uh, of the challenge that we have had. Certainly, uh, Louisiana has had the largest disinvestment in higher education in the nation. Uh, we have, with bipartisan support, turned the corner in the last session and stabilized, and I think higher ed has had no cuts in the last two years. Uh, but again, we've had a lot of, of journey of long doing more with less and much more with less, and now it's a question of how do we do more with more. So we did have the governor come, Governor John Bell Edwards, come to our board last month to talk about how we move from a crisis every quarter to now lifting up our head to say, what do we want to be? And how do we make sure higher education is reinvestment ready? I will say one way to do that is not for higher ed to talk to higher ed about higher ed. <laughs> Society has to say higher education, education is a worthy investment. And so we have to make sure people understand whether you see this as a moral imperative, fair, right, and just, or as an economic imperative that we produce taxpayers, uh, that we educate people who do not need Medicaid, who will not be incarcerated, who will be contributing to society, all of those messages have to be coming from every corner of our state. There has to be a drumbeat to say, we want to ensure that we're educating for the future. Because when you think about a prosperous Louisiana, that's what we do. When you think about blue ocean economic development, that's what we do. When you think about solutions to poverty and anti-crime, that's what we do. And so we have to make sure we have more champions telling our story and that we are continuing to improve so people see that we are reinvestment ready. Amen. All right, Dr. Kalick. As I anticipate the opening of the Kathleen Babineau Blanco Public Policy Center this coming January, I'm hopeful that the center will address the issues I've spent my adult life trying to improve. In my estimation, the Blanco Public Policy Center has an opportunity to make a tremendous impact on a major public health problem plaguing our country and our state. Suicide is the problem, and it's linked to many other social problems, such as poverty, unemployment, mental illness, and addiction. Suicide is a crisis in America. It's the 10th leading cause of death in the US. It's 11th in Louisiana overall, but for uh, age, the age group of 15 to 34 in Louisiana, it's the third leading cause of death. In Evangeline and Avoyles parishes, the rate is more than double the national average. Nationally, suicide is more than double the murder rate. Four times more people die by suicide each year than from HIV. Some populations appear more at risk for suicide. Men complete suicide four times more often than women. People who are white complete suicide disproportionately to other groups. And people in middle age complete most often. Firearms are used in more than half of suicides each year. Veterans and active duty military personnel have a high risk of suicide, making up 16% of all suicides. In the US, more than 40,000 people die by suicide each year, but that is the tip of the iceberg because more than 130,000 people are hospitalized. 
405,000 people visiting the emergency room for self-harm each year, 1 million attempting suicide each year, and 9 million seriously considering suicide each year. So to boil that down for you, for every one person that completes suicide, there are more than 229 people who seriously consider it. Based on all of those facts, few could disagree that suicide is a public health epidemic. But discussion of suicide is shrouded in taboos. Stigma surrounds suicide deaths and mental illness. Although not all people who suicide have di a diagnosed mental illness, about half do, and the remaining may not have access to professional help services or are unwilling to seek help because of cultural attitudes and stigma surrounding mental health. One taboo has been about talking due to a misconception that if we talk about suicide or ask about it, then we put the idea into a person's mind. But research suggests that's not the case. They are already thinking about it and are usually relieved to be able to talk to someone about it. Another misconception is that suicide is caused by one thing, specifically depression. But most depressed people don't suicide. The CDC estimates that there are between 15 and 16 million episodes of depression each year in the United States. Yet 45,000 people are lost to suicide, so something else is going on. Another misconception is that it can't be prevented, but it can. 20 years ago, suicide was seen as a private matter between parent, patients and their healthcare providers. Suicide was not discussed as a public health problem. Evidence about effective treatment was sparse. Clinical training in suicide assessment and treatment was rare. Virtually no funding existed for suicide prevention until 1999, when the Surgeon General issued a call to action to prevent suicide. In 2001, the first national strategy for suicide prevention was developed. In 2002, the first Suicide Prevention Resource Center was developed. And in 2005, the first National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or Hotline was opened. Yet, there has been an increase in suicide rates across the nation during those same 20 years. Every state, uh, in a report that was released by the CDC in June of 2018, uh, they showed that in every state except Nevada, had an increase of at least 6% in their suicide rate over the last 20 years, with a 30% increase in more than half of states. In Louisiana, that increase was 29%. Studies of New Orleans specifically has shown an increase in rates in the years following Hurricane Katrina. What do we know about the training needed to prevent suicide? We know it works, even in small doses, we also know we need more of it. In Louisiana in 2008, the legislature passed Act 219 that requires educators to have at least two hours of suicide prevention training, which is a start. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, has produced several toolkits, including a really good best practices suicide prevention toolkit for schools. But few know it's there or how to use it. It's also a cost issue. We need money appropriated to train educators while they miss class in order to receive training. We also know this, there is no mandatory suicide prevention training in graduate school or to have a license as a mental health professional. Research is clear that nine out of 10 licensed counselors would not pass a basic competency exam for suicide training. This is such a big problem. You expect that the people you refer a person who is at risk to, to be ready to help them. We want anyone who receives someone at risk to have the training and that that training be based in sound research that it works. If I asked anything of our future policymakers, it would be to see about the need for training in mental health. You would never go to a cardiologist who didn't know CPR. But this isn't a problem that will be solved by only one group of professionals like school counselors or therapists in the veteran community or even mental health professionals at large. A community approach is what 
will get us out of this. It's partially educators in schools. It's partially parents. It's us as researchers asking questions. It's legislators supporting increased funding for suicide prevention. It's physicians, because a large number of those who die by suicide saw their doctor within 30 days of taking their life. So we need to do more across more professions. Solving this problem is about making this a conversation around the kitchen table in churches on Sunday. It's making sure the media widely publicized so people know the signs and symptoms and the lifeline number or crisis text line number, where even if they aren't the person who is suicidal, but they are helping, they are assisting someone who is, they can get coaching help in the moment. Solving this problem is about changing school climates in the context of bullying. We have a lot of research about what works, but we don't resource it so schools can do it. Solving this problem is about raising consciousness collectively and reducing stigma by talking about it, letting people know real hope is out there. Solving this problem is about educating the faith-based community, especially the clergy. It's about changing access to lethal means by locking firearms and medications away. For example, by offering to take their firearm for a while. We don't let friends drive drunk, we take their keys. It's about looking not just within individuals, but at the community and the system that puts people at risk. It's about agencies partnering with one another to develop strategies that work and making sure that everyone who comes into behavioral health care is assessed and given an individualized path of care, not just involuntary hospitalization in a one-size-fits-all model. It's about preventing social isolation and increasing connectedness. It's about recognizing that when people are in psychological distress or pain, they may turn to substances or suicide to escape that pain. So maybe prevention can focus on all three of those since they have common factors. We do know that alcohol and drugs are in the blood at intoxicating levels for most completed suicides. It's about collaboration because this rests on all of our shoulders. In the last 10 years, we've invested federal funding for research, leading, for re, for research into leading causes of death like HIV and AIDS, heart disease, and prostate cancer. Major progress has led to decreased mortality rates for those causes of death. For just one of them, HIV and AIDS, as an example, $2.9 billion in funding in 2013. Um, there was a 53% decrease in death rates in the 10 years previous to that. Heart disease, $1.2 billion in federal funding dollars with a 29% decrease in the same time period in death rates. Prostate cancer, 266 million in federal funding with a 13% decrease in death rates in the same period. But for suicide, only 37 million with a 20% increase in death rates. Going back to HIV for a moment, we know how to educate for prevention of HIV and we're able to slow the rates of new infection as a result. When someone is infected, we've learned to get them into care as soon as possible to manage what has become a chronic illness rather than an automatic death sentence the way it was at the start of that epidemic. We've learned that it's important to get someone who is infected with HIV on medications to bring them to a non-detectable viral load and make them healthier for their own sakes and less virulent to others and to reduce further the spread of the virus in that way. We've done very well with expanding our prevention efforts to look at root causes and risk factors like homelessness and substance abuse that are linked to HIV infection risk. It's time we do the same with suicide. And I anticipate that the Kathleen Babineau Blanco Public Policy Center is poised perfectly to do just that. Dr. Kalick, thank you for those beautiful and inspiring remarks and for your pioneering spirit in a field that is not well understood. And what um, comes to me listening to this is this is exactly 
what Governor Blanco could have listened to 20 years ago or 30 years ago about domestic violence, which was not talked about outside of the home, or child abuse and neglect, which really wasn't talked about outside of the home. Those are the kind of headwinds that Governor Blanco came into the legislature before the, when the children were very, some of them are here and they were very small. Those were some of the things that people said to her. Well, that's wonderful for you to talk about that, but these are private issues. They don't really affect the community. But one of the extraordinary things about this leader is she knew that was not true. And even though most of the men were saying those things, she knew in her heart that wasn't true. And so she just created a new path. And I think our state and our country, I don't think I know, has been immensely benefited by her leadership. So the value of this institute is to take that spirit that she brought the first day she showed up in the legislature, the first day she showed up in the local office, and continue it with these kinds of new and emerging understandings that we have as a society that collectively we can do something about this and we don't have to just accept that this happens. And what you didn't mention, but I'm sure you were thinking about it, is for every one that completes suicide, for everyone that attempts suicide, if you multiply that by all the friends and family members that suffer around that suffering, you're talking about a pretty far-reaching situation. Of course this is a public issue. Of course this is something we should do. So that's an, a perfect example of what I think our institute here with the great leaders will continue. Why don't we jump, since we uh, want to keep everybody on time, to Secretary Wilson. But you got to say your first job, all right? We got to do that. What was your first <laughs> job? We're not going to let you get away with it. Doctor. First paid job was drive through in Burger King. <laughs> OK, you see this? <laughs> I'm sure she was excellent with that voice. Can I help you, you know? <laughs> Wonderful. All right, Secretary. So, you know, everything that Deanne said just now makes what we do in infrastructure seems small um, in, in all seriousness. So um, at the very beginning, uh, let me just say how honored I am to be here and to participate on this panel because uh, what Dean Kellerman said and Senator Landrieu said about Governor Blanco's leadership, uh, what rings true for me is that maternal love effect that she provided for lots of folks, not just her family but others because for me, we were extensions of that family. And my time working uh, under her leadership and the example she provided brought that to me and allows me to do that for staff and for folks I work with. And so I'm very honored to be here for that. Um, I will tell you the legacy um, of Governor Blanco's leadership, not necessarily just with uh, her term as governor, but to Public Service Commission, all of those things for me, it comes back to the framework, to the infrastructure, to what we do and how we provide for folks. How do we keep people safe? And so in an environment where we talk about uh, addressing poverty and economic opportunity and community development uh, to attract people, to have a quality of life, it starts in many respects with infrastructure. Just the history of this state began with a river. Uh, the Mississippi River, and it fed the rest of the United States of America. Um, and so infrastructure is pretty critical, and it's something we tend to take for granted. And when I think about the leadership of Governor Blanco, I think about things like safety of folks on the roads, because it was during her tenure that we began installing cable barriers and infrastructure. And those are those sidewalks down the in middle of the interstate that people call them, and those three little wires that you see, they save lives. They've been hit over a thousand times in one year. And every time you hit it, cars don't go through it. Trucks, 18 wheelers and school buses don't go through it. And when you have a cross median collision, you have a death. So those are lives that were saved and we're well on our way to over 300 miles. And it started under Governor Blanco. 
when I think about uh, infrastructure and a model of the timed program that did not uh, sustain itself very well, it got its leap forward under Governor Blanco where she made the decision to proceed with uh, investing in widening the Mississippi River Bridge in New Orleans called Hewitt P. Long and building the Florida Avenue Bridge. And it was under her leadership that we broke ground, if you remember Governor Myra Murtis on I-49 to connect South Louisiana to the rest of the world in terms of the interstate. And on October 17th, we're going to finish that stretch uh, 30 plus miles of interstate and it's going to be the most beautiful interchange that you've ever seen. Um, sounds funny to say interchange is beautiful, <laughs> but it really will be because it represented a process that the community participated in. It represented a process that they said the artist represented what Shreveport is and we've now made that a part of that infrastructure permanently. And that's the type of leadership that we provided. So where do we go from here in terms of what we do? Well, there are a couple of things I think that from an infrastructure perspective, um, you have to think about disaster. When you look at what's happening in South Carolina and North Carolina, um, so much of what we did here in Katrina, we're still being recognized in leading efforts of resiliency. Uh, I'll be speaking in Colorado talking about how we responded and the things that we did, whether it was ContraFlow, whether it was how we got reimbursed from FEMA on certain things. Most importantly, we're taking that exercise uh, and that experience known as Katrina to say, how do we improve what we've done? How do we build a bridge bigger, wider, and better? Um, so when the twin spans went under, we didn't take the leadership of what the country said, just go back and do exactly what you did. If we knew up front that we're wetter, we're wilder, and we're weirder in terms of our environment, we should be prepared for that. So let's build the bridge higher, let's build the bridge wider to accommodate it. And we were able to do that with the governor's help and leadership in Washington post Katrina. So how we respond in disasters is important to keep people safe and get them out of harm's way. And that's that maternal instinct of safety and protection when you stand in front of those who are vulnerable to protect and keep them safe. So the leadership provided that. The second thing I'll tell you is the development of our communities and our cities all complements the issue of poverty, the issues of education, the issues of health care. If you're someone with some physical disabilities, you need to be able to get on the sidewalk, get into the building, not sit in the rain when you wait on transit or a bus. You need to not trip over routes built into the sidewalk that have overgrown. And so the world we're living in now, I think, is feeding off some of the success in terms of the developmental process. How do we talk to communities? How do we engage with folks to give them what they want with the best practice and expertise of what we as professionals have found? Some of the success, I think, of what the governor provided in terms of connectivity for uh, AI, and from my perspective, it's connected in autonomous vehicles. When you think about the data that this little box produces on a daily basis and how we manage that, it will inform our decision-making process. It will help us be better at what we do to be more sustainable, to be more thoughtful in what that result is. And so I'm, I'm hopeful from an infrastructure perspective that we can have a framework to engage in that with building off of what we've done. And then the last thing I think that uh, stands out for me is sustainable solutions. How do we sustain what we do? In infrastructure, we take for granted that it's always gonna be there. No road is perpetual. I could tell you there are things on the deferred maintenance list for state buildings, for universities, for higher education, uh, for hospitals that were on the list when Governor Blanco was governor to have work done. Infrastructure's the same way. And so when you think about everything you own, buy, sell, or trade, it's interfaced with a road, a rail, a runway, or a river. How do we make sure that we can continue to get the things that we like and we want? And so we've got to be sustainable. So this center, in my opinion, offers us a framework to make the types of decisions the way the governor showed us how she made decisions when she was governor. She was nonpartisan. She was thoughtful. But more importantly, she relied on experts, much like Deanne said, well, you're not going to go to a cardiologist that doesn't know anything about CPR. So government is just like that. Government means I need to find out how other places are doing it. We've spent a great deal of time, and Senator Landrieu is very much aware of what happens in the Netherlands with water. 
we've got the expertise because we're sitting in that same vulnerable position in the Gulf of Mexico. And so what are the experts telling us? What are the best practices? Let's not assume that we know exactly how to do it all the time. And so from a perspective of helping government, because if nothing else, you will work with governors, and I've had the pleasure of working with uh, two really outstanding ones and another governor. Um, but the idea that every governor, all of the governors you see, work to try and manage a process that legislators, the people who are gonna set the policies, they don't always get it. And so my hope is that this center will help us make better decisions as government with a process that is applicable to all of these issues, if it's criminal justice, if it's higher education, if it's infrastructure, if it's healthcare. What's the framework that we can make decisions going forward to accommodate these disruptive technologies that we're gonna see, these disruptive processes? The idea of 3D printing and all of those things that are gonna change how and what we do in very big ways in the very near future, we have to be able to accommodate that from a policy making perspective. And the laboratory of a university, the laboratory of the best and brightest minds, the thinkers, looking at those problems, dissecting them and putting them back together, that is what this policy center can do, regardless of the issue, regardless of how we are gonna develop as a country. We're always gonna have rural, we're always gonna have urban, it's all gonna be there. Infrastructure is going to connect us. The people are what matters. And I hope and I believe that the Policy Center will provide solutions for that. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And I think the historical record is going to show that Governor Blanco oversaw and managed probably the greatest investment of in dollar amount of infrastructure ever in the state's history. And the reason that I think that I can say that is because if you think of the massive infusion of federal money that came shaped by her leadership into the state to build just off the top of my head, $14 billion of levy protection in South Louisiana, you could name three or four other major issues, the $640 million, if I remember my number correctly, of the I-10 bridge that connects St. Tammany to... Oh, it was $790 was it? million. $790, see? Yeah. I knew the the, the surface transportation yeah. elements under her leadership yeah. was over $8 billion. $8 just billion, surface $8 billion just surface transportation. Then when you add the levy and flood control protection that was initiated by the governor and the administration, and not just, which is easy to do, and we do this all in our life, it's easy to kind of build the same thing that was there. And it's a tendency to do that, because um, it's easy and you've done it once before, and so the hardest thing is to be creative and building it new and better and stronger. And that was really one of the key leadership legacies that Governor Blanco is going to leave because she insisted just from her own, uh, you know, her own intellect and her own passion and her own knowledge of how societies should grow and develop that we do it better, we build it better, we design it better with more safety and the legacy of, um, the Netherlands piece too is something that we had the you know worked on together, and and she was phenomenal. Going, finding the best practice in the world, bringing it here to Louisiana, challenging us to be the best we can be. Yes. Can, can you identify yourself, please? Uh, that's an easy question. So um, I, I will tell you I worked with Governor Edwards, Governor Jindal, uh, Governor Blanco, and Governor Foster. So there were four. All right. And what was your first job? My, my, I was a slow learner. My first job was a volunteer at F. Edward A. Bear for three years in high school. Uh, in college, I was a resident assistant. And then I worked at the Planning Commission here. And my first job with Governor Blanco was actually the Louisiana Surf Commission, which grew volunteerism in this state and has sustained it very well from teachers to building homes and planting trees, uh, was at the Louisiana Surf Commission, brought me back to my volunteer experience.
And we'll come back to that at the end because that's an amazing legacy and I don't want to um, overskip that. Let's go to our next, um, uh, Dr. Malloy. Well, thank you so much for, for having me here and it's a real honor to be able to celebrate the legacy of, of Governor Blanco and, and talk about policy initiatives for ways that we can continue to improve our state. Uh, as a political scientist, I'm really interested in issues of civic engagement and how we can get people more involved. And Governor Blanco, just in her legacy as a public servant, has been an inspiration to so many as the first female governor. Uh, it's something to look at uh, for other women and think, I can do that. I could run for office or even have motivation to show up and participate in elections. Uh, Senator Landry has been asking us what our, our first jobs were as a uh, a kid growing up in rural Virginia, I grew up on a tobacco farm. So I spent all of my springs and summers and falls you know, out in the field. I was the, and still am, the only person in my family to have gone to college. And having a set of powerful role models around to say that you know, your zip code does not determine your outcome, to say that you, know, you can be an effective participant and a and a change maker uh, is incredibly important and I appreciate that part of her legacy of, of setting that role model. Uh, so I want to spend a little time today thinking about how we can more effectively get more people involved in, in civic life. And a starting point for thinking about that is voting because for so many people, voting is the gateway drug <laughs> into further civic participation in life. Um, Louisiana, is unfortunately all too commonly on the wrong end of the list. Whenever we are reported in the national news media for anything, we all sort of hold their breath and think, oh gosh, where are we going to be ranked against all of the other states? And thank goodness for Mississippi and Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, but, but one area where we actually do pretty darn well is voter turnout in presidential elections. In, in 2012, Louisiana was among the top 10 of states in terms of voter turnout. Uh, in 2016, we had 67.8% of our registered voters participate in the election, with on average most other states coming in around 60%. So we, we do a pretty good job of getting our registered voters out for presidential elections. Um, for state and local elections, there's lots of room for improvement. Uh, and to pick on our own parish here in Lafayette, just in our past recent elections on significant and important meaningful policy issues of millage renewals, of, of school bonds and taxes, we have at our height reached 13.8% voter turnout. And on the low end, 2.5%. Think of the organizations that you're a part of. Whenever any organization you're, you're with wants to transact business, you have to have a quorum of your members to be able to even hold an effective meeting and make any decisions. And yet, we are routinely making financial decisions, policy decisions for our communities with less than a tenth of registered voters participating to say nothing of the eligible voters who aren't registered and aren't participating. So I want to put forth some avenues for us to think about how we can get more people involved. And in order to increase turnout, we have to begin by getting more people registered. So one option or avenue that we could think about is making it available for um, voters to actually register on the same day that an election is held. Right. You show up at your polling precinct, and rather than uh, having to register far in advance, you could do it on that same day. Now, here in Louisiana, I want to say we've, we've made some progress. You still have to register 20 days ahead of time, but you can do it from your phone. And public service announcement, you need to do that by October 16th in order to participate in the November 6th election. <laughs> you can download the GoVote app, and you can do it in five minutes, but you still have to do it ahead of time. We now have 15 states in the union that have moved to same-day registration. And they have improved, on average, 7% uh, voter turnout just by making that one simple change. That's a pretty big bang for your buck in terms of policy outcomes. A second possibility that we could consider 
is moving to automatic voter registration. The way that works is whenever you go and you get any kind of official ID from your state, you're going to go get your new real ID driver's license, you're going to go get um, you know, just an official state ID, you're automatically enrolled to vote. Today, when you go and get those IDs, you're given the option, but it doesn't happen automatically. Oregon has recently adopted this method, and in the 2016 presidential election, they saw the highest increase in voter turnout of any state in the union. And I think far more important, the demographics of the people who voted changed significantly as a result of this measure. The pool of voters in Oregon as a re result of uh, automatic voter registration became more racially diverse, and there was a much stronger pool of young voters and low income voters making the people who registered and showed up look much more like the actual members of their community. But the third avenue that I'd like for us to consider, and that by far can have the biggest impact on changing participation in elections, is by moving the election dates themselves. We can do all that we want in terms of developing voter guides and get out the vote methods. And I do not mean to disparage those because I'm one of the people who does those things. But those pale in comparison to having our local election cycle sync up with the national cycle. For many voters, thinking about voting is a habit. It's like watching the Olympics. It comes around every four years, you tune on your television, you pay attention, you get involved. But most of the rest of the time, you're not really thinking about it. Voting works the same way, and it's much easier to change the election date than it is to change the habits of voters. In Louisiana, we usually have about four dates every year that are options uh, for us to hold elections. These calendars are set by the Secretary of State, and they're set years in advance. But local parishes have options on when they actually hold millage elections or elections for local officials. Uh, you could do it in March, you could do it in April, but you could just as easily do it in November. Louisiana has more elections than anybody. Um, and as a result, our voters experience voter fatigue. They just get tired of showing up to the polls. It's also expensive to hold this many elections. Right? You have to pay the polling workers, not that I want to decrease their pay, but you have to pay them and you also have to pay to transport the voting uh, equipment and maintain it. So actually by syncing up our uh, election calendar with the national calendar, we reduced cost as well as increasing turnout. So why do we not do that? Um, one cynical take is that our local parish governments want to hold all of these millage elections on off-cycle dates in the middle of festivals, right, when no one's going to show up because they can be sure to sneak through tax, uh, taxes and get them passed. Well, if that's their strategy, it's a terrible one. Uh, all of the res every single research study that has been done on this issue has shown that low turnout elections are much more likely to have opposition to taxes than support. And the math is simple. The kinds of people who show up for a March election are older, they're much more affluent, and they tend to be white. All demographics associated with anti-tax sensibilities. Moreover, having off-cycle elections makes those elections much more susceptible to outside influence and in the wake of the Citizens United decision, much more susceptible to outside campaign funding. Right? You can get a lot of bang for your buck by just spending a few thousand dollars to oppose a ballot initiative for a local election, sway just a couple of hundred voters, and you can determine that outcome. Whereas you're sp spending hundreds of thousands, if not millions, to try to sway uh, national level federal elections. So, we make deliberate choices about when to hold elections. A hundred years ago, whenever this movement started to have local elections on a different election cycle, I think it made sense. 
the reasoning was let's keep national level partisan divisions out of our local elections, out of our state elections. That's, we're deluding ourselves if we're thinking that we're keeping national level partisan politics by having an April election instead of November one. What we are doing is we are making a deliberate decision to empower people with money and resources over the rest of the community. We are privileging two to four percent of our community who are registered to decide outcomes for all of the rest of us. If we want to take seriously the idea of increasing civic participation, if we care about getting all of our community members involved, it is time for us to seriously reconsider the way that we register voters and the timing of our election calendar. And I think this is a prime area, given Governor Blanco's history on trying to increase voter participation that uh, this center can take up this cause. What an interesting presentation. And what occurred to me as you were speaking, Doctor, is that um, Governor Blanco and I are not 100 years old yet. <laughs> um, but Governor Blanco was born in 1942. The women just, women just got the right to vote in 1920. So when governor was born, it was only 22 years since women in this country had even the right to vote. Now, in 1920, you can do the math, the country was hundreds of years old and if you think from the 1600s, you know, when sort of the l little colonies began and the European colonies, I mean, I'm talking about indigenous folks that were here and civilizations and communities. So we went for hundreds of years, this concept, and of course it was true for African Americans as well and people of color, we couldn't vote. By the time she and I showed up in the legislature, it's, it wasn't like that long ago. <laughs> you know, we're like women couldn't vote. We know members of our family, our grandmothers, our, you know, that it was just, they couldn't vote. I don't care how strong a view they had. I don't care what kind of amazing speech they could give, what kind of expert they were in the field of, let's say, the issue on the ballot. They were not welcome. They were not involved. And so to move from the legacy of the, us and others getting into politics, recently, you know, when women could even vote, let alone walk on a floor to vote in a legislative body, to this call for action, you know, and then you think about it in light of the challenge and stress on our democracy today, you know, with what is our democracy, recognizing this is a fundamental right for people to vote, et cetera, et cetera, free speech, free press, freedom of assembly, you know, freedom to vote, this institute could have a major impact for our state, for our region. So please keep up the good work. Comment, question, anything? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I'm a UL student and I'm voting commissioner for the 20th year district. I applaud that gesture. Thank you. 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 provisional ballot. Yeah. Instead of the greatest democracy in the world turning people away that show up to vote, the fundamental, fundamental core of our entire country, people are turned away because, well, you used to live at such and such address, but you don't live. It doesn't matter that they've worked for 50 years, paid taxes 50 years, raised, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's really outrageous. And the other outrageous thing, the governor I've spoken many times, is having anyone, but particularly with mothers with small children, waiting for three hours in the snow or rain to vote. Has anybody ever tried to hold a two-year-old on your hip recently? <laughs> I mean, I was trying to do that this morning, you know, with my grandson. I mean, could you imagine that? So these are the kinds of things that the governor would challenge us with and hopefully the institute can continue. 
to get a stronger, better. Thank you for sharing. Okay, doctor? One more question. Oh, I'm sorry. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Actually, I think that's one of the things that might keep people voting because having a closed primary system actually leads to lower voter turnout. So one of the things that, ironically, I might argue to keep is this system that allows us uh, to have more input and competition, even intra-party. Yes, that's a hard one to explain to a voter saying, no, it's yep. closed. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's make this woman's job easier. Right. You know, let it like it's whatever. All we want to do. You can vote. We want your yeah. <laughs> a wonderful. I pray for Great. you. Let's give you a round of applause. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, uh, Dr. Key. Good morning. I still believe it's morning. Um, everyone, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here, uh, and this is such an important time for the state of Louisiana to be in this room, uh, to have a university that's connected to such uh, a mission and a legacy as, as Governor Blanco's. Uh, I've, I've seen this operate in different states with different universities, these connections that are so important to creating transformative change for local communities, for the state, uh, that the energy behind this center, I think, will infuse you know, so much more passion into our region that is very hopeful to see and, and start on this path um, now and today and moving forward. Um, I'm a product of Florida. Um, my arch rival, Florida State University, has set up uh, these kinds of networks uh, and relationships with um, agencies throughout the state, and I've seen it work in other settings, and I know it can work here. Uh, when I moved to the state, um, in Louisiana in 2010, uh, I, I noticed that there was a lot of work for a criminologist um, to do. Uh, there was a lot of issues that were facing the state. Um, most notably, our, our incarceration rates were bar none in the world, let alone in the United States. Um, I have a background in substance abuse and addiction, um, which you know, is an advantage for me as a researcher moving here uh, but I also had a passion to connect with people, build relationships that would start that transformative change. And our moniker here at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette is research for a reason. Now, I don't know if that brand has really connected with our researchers, with our academics, uh, nor has it connected with our practitioner partnerships, our agencies across the state. Uh, but again, we're, we're starting on that road now. And I just wanted to um, talk to you about this one little random story uh, that, that comes to mind. When I first moved to Louisiana, young little baby assistant professor, you know, uh, kind of eyes wide open, but really didn't know how things operate, how politics worked, how barriers worked, you know, potentially to, um, you know, these kinds of collaborations. But, what I learned quickly was that Louisiana treats people like family. Um, even a, a random Florida boy that moved out um, in his early 30s, Louisiana opened their arms to me and, and treated me like family. Um, so what I wanted to kind of get across is the importance of relationships and just and the importance of simple things like making a phone call you know, to people in positions of power, people at agencies, and just have a conversation. You know, get away from the computer, move away from email, just call, leave a message, um, try to make an appointment with some folks to have a conversation. And, and that's really what happened to me that really started me on this path of getting involved with justice reform throughout the state of uh, Louisiana. Um, one day, just randomly, I connected with um, you know, my supervisor at the time, a department head at uh, Loyola University in New Orleans, of you know, just asking, like, who, who can I talk to to you know, get involved, to start a conversation? And, and he put me in touch with um, a sheriff on the North Shore. And the North Shore, uh, you know, so St. Tammany Parish, was the epicenter at the time in 2013 of the incarceration problem of Louisiana, AKA of the, the world. You know, and, and 
um, plenty of um, newspaper articles, they were you know, splashed in headlines, St. Tammany Parish was, of being the number one in Louisiana, which means number one in the world, of incarcerating their adult offenders at a rate that was just blinding. Almost one in a thousand adults, even more than that, were behind bars or justice involved in some way, shape, or form. So little baby professor, Don's on uh, his University of Florida polo, you know, goes into the lion's den that was LSU judges, LSU court administrators, LSU. It's like, oh, wow, I should have thought differently, but at least we're in the <laughs> SEC. You know, we, we, can, we can enjoy that together. But just had a conversation and creating those relationships of, of just picking up a phone call and talking to people that haven't really dealt with an academic, a scholar in years or knew how to get in touch with somebody that had that that skill set, that, that tool um, that they can use to just get an ear um, for you know, things that were evidence-based, things that were practical, things that we can build together that um, would start chipping away at you know, some of those problems. And, and Dr. Kalick um, notably you know, started all along those lines in terms of evaluating drug courts um, in Louisiana. And our idea is really adapted from that. It's taking those evidence-based programs that we knew worked in the past, and we just put those ideas on steroids together, and we created a program for people that pretty much were one step away from serving a life sentence or doing at least 30 years at Angola. And the innovation was we're going to give some folks in St. Tammany Parish one last chance to operate in a drug court model but the catch was the district attorney wanted some skin in the game. So the skin was to serve two years incarcerated. Um, it was a program that initially started um, on the South Shore in Orleans Parish. Um, but the model that we operated in St. Tammany turned out to be the model of the state. We sent young offenders for the most part. For the most part, they're around age 25 on average. But we even had offenders age 55, just stone cold addicts their whole life didn't really get the help they needed throughout their entire criminal careers. And finally, we infused hope in these offenders. And all of a sudden, you know, we saw that they looked out for one another. Uh, they knew that the court system, the judges who volunteered their time, um, the probation and parole officers who served them were all aligned with the same hope and the same goal of making sure this individual doesn't return to prison. Um, and in fact, it's the only program that I know of in the United States that uses evidence-based programs for um, offenders that reoffend throughout their life that works over time. That not only past 12 months, you know, do not go back to prison even after that. You know, so we've successfully reduced the recidivism rates of those offenders um, beyond half, which was our goal. And we're trying to replicate these kinds of programs you know, throughout Louisiana. Um, we're trying to expand that to the state. And that's what you know, we're starting here at uh, UL, is partnering with the Department of um, Public Safety and Corrections, you know, bringing that science to our partners and having those stakeholders and meeting with them and understanding their needs, but also meeting with um, our partners where they are, knowing that our resources are limited you know, that we're fatigued after years and years of being 48th, 49th, or 50th, thanks Oklahoma, Mississippi, um, that that family feel of looking out for one another through relationship building, through making sure that we get our partners at the table, but also getting the infusion of the people that we're treating at the table too to understand needs, needs of agencies. These are the people that are doing the treatment, that are caring for one another. And I want to jump off of what Dr. Kalick was saying, is that, you know, mental illness and mental health is so critical, and we're starting to realize that. Um, but we often overlook the people that are, are working and helping professionals. The people that are in the field, they're actually not well paid, that are passionate but are fatigued, that every single day they see failure and they, they often don't see those successes. And once you align that mission 
and you align a university and you align a brand that we're doing something for a reason. We're researching for a reason. These aren't just academic questions, and that's a peeve. That's you know, knowledge for knowledge's sake. No, we, we are committing ourselves in partnership with our teams and the people that we treat to better their lives and better our own lives too and, and learn from it. And that's what I hope you know, some of our research will you know, tell in the stories of not only our participants, but the people in the, the field, the people that are providing those services, making sure that they're okay and making sure that we take time to make sure the people that are providing those services are getting what they need. You know, we so heavily rely on our first responders, our police, our EMS workers, to respond to us when we're in crisis. But what about them? You know, their, their rates of suicide, their rates of substance abuse, um, and we're not even well knowledgeable on the rates of issues of um, mental health, mental illness, and, and just despondence of our people that are working in corrections, of our probation and parole officers. Uh, and that knowledge is starting to surface. And um, I, I think we can really do something transformative if we take that excitement of looking into all these research questions and informing our partners of solutions together. And you know, pick up that phone call. Go visit somebody. Get away from your computer and your email and, and just have conversations. And I think that's what this center can bring to this university, that passion. Thank you. Really wonderful and inspirational. I just love that um, research for a reason. You know, so many universities that we know, I think, Governor, are kind of turned inward to themselves, you know, with maybe one or two little, you know, lookouts and research for research, purpose, knowledge for knowledge. But boy, if we could get all of our universities just to model you know, some of that thinking, like research for reason, mm -hmm. linking to the communities that we're trying to reach to, how transformative you know, that could be. So that's another example of a breakthrough here. Any comments or questions or anybody? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Here, up there, I'm not sure. Can y'all hear? Okay, up there. Any other? Excellent, excellent. Any other question or comment? Okay, let's move to our um, last, but most certainly uh, not least, um, uh, Miss Porsche Ricks. Yes. So this is my first time having to present with glasses. Okay, I'm moving. I'm moving along. Okay. Um, <laughs> Governor Blanco, yes, yes. Um, I, so good morning, and I, I have to say, um, I'm just a, such a fan of the governor. I um, have to tell you that um, when the governor was in office, I served as the undersecretary of the Department of Social Services. That was the DCFS's previous name. And my now 13-year-old uh, took her first steps in the budget office on a Saturday. <laughs> at DSS. Um, I served under uh, Secretary Ann Silverberg Williamson, and um, it was just wonderful uh, to, to work with the governor. And as a foundation to what I want to say about uh, policies with the governor and, and experiences with her and where we are now and where we're going, I just want to give you a snapshot of um, the year of our Lord, 2005, OK? Um, as the undersecretary, I was the chief financial officer responsible for the budget and fiscal, IT, HR, administrative services, and emergency preparedness. 
At that time, we were a $1.2 billion agency. We employed 5,200 Louisianians to provide child welfare services, economic stability services. We didn't have anybody employed for emergency preparedness. Me. <laughs> we had some people identified, but not employed for that very service. So we were the primary state agency responsible for coordinating sheltering, housing, and human services. So as you can imagine, when we really understood that after all, Katrina really was coming to Louisiana, we got really, really busy helping with the evacuation and sheltering and many, many other things. And then once the storm passed, now we find Louisiana's children, that are, those are in state care. It takes us, that takes on a role while we're still sheltering the tens of thousands of people, while we're then um, also dealing with the 1,400 of our own staff members that were displaced from their offices and while several of our offices are closed. Soon after, we turn our attention to disaster food stamp issuance, then to long-term sheltering, short-term housing, to recovery, long-term recovery. We're still caring for our employees. In response to Hurricanes Katrina and Rita, DSS employees clocked 250,000 hours above their normal work. We still had 1,400 people that were displaced. So now all of those efforts happened with the governor's leadership, federal agencies, local agencies. Someone talked about FEMA, 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 different FEMA every other week, hmm. right? Um, collaborating with nonprofits like never before. So what had to happen immediately after the storms is that our courageous governor had to make some necessary moves to keep us afloat, because of course the federal government haven't yet, hadn't yet given us more money for our recovery. So my recollection shows DSS budget authority by executive order cut soon after that, special session budget cut, expenditures made on behalf of the response and recovery were not budgeted in our office, so cut. We were very concerned. We were very well led. Thank you, Governor. Cushioning and very much complicating the blow of the budget cuts was the federal dollars that then came in because of her audacious fight for the funds to rebuild Louisiana. For DSS, that meant $16.4 million coming in for vocational rehabilitation, $32.4 million extra for TANF, TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needed Families for Emergency Recovery, and the responsibility for us to administer and the opportunity for us to use some of $220.9 million of supplemental social services block grant, SSBG funds. So now, we got through this scenario, nobody got laid off, none of our core services went away, but we had a lot of money to use to tackle some of the things that we needed to tackle. And due to Governor Blanco's leadership, we were well poised to do that because about six weeks before Hurricane Katrina, Governor signed Executive Order KBB 0517. What did that do? Well, it started the Solutions to Poverty Council, and it set up a way for us to uh, look at addressing some of the poverty that we had in the state. If she hadn't done that already, we might not have been so well poised to use the funding that we got. We saw quality child care. We saw early learning increase. We saw the expansion of access to health care for Louisiana's children. We saw the passage of the earned income tax credit and a lot of other great policy. And though we lost some ground after Governor Blanco, due to the current priorities in the current administration, we see new strides. We saw the expansion of the earned income tax credit in the past regular session. 
We see bipartisan support for other measures uh, trying to tackle policy. The, there was a Senate Bill 561 by Senator Regina Barrow creating the Empowering Families to Live Well Act, very much like the Poverty Council that was set up under Governor Blanco. They're focusing on stabilizing families, and there's some other work. There's work from nonprofits. Our $1.2 billion agency under Governor Blanco is now about $680 million agency. Our 5,200 employees are now 3,400 employees. We must have the work of nonprofits and entities like this one to do our work because we've got to be smarter. And we've got to make sure that we're doing things that will make a difference. One of the nonprofits we're working with, United Way. Have you seen the United Way's Alice Report? It highlights and educates us regarding not just poverty, but also what they call the Alice households, asset limited, income constrained, employed household. So we have about 21% of households are in poverty, the way the federal government says is poverty, right? And yet we've got another 40% that are asset limited, constrained, income constrained, employed household. We learn with the cost of living higher than what most wages pay, Alice families work hard and earn above the federal poverty level, but not enough to afford a basic household budget of housing, child care, food, transportation, and health care. Alice households live in every parish of this state. They are urban, suburban, rural. They include women and men, young and old of all races and, ethn and ethnicities. Where are we going? We know we've got to work together to address these issues. We know we need a minimum wage increase. We know we need income, income equity for Louisiana. There was another thing that happened. There were many things that happened, but with this infusion of social services block grant at that time, Governor Blanco allowed the secretary and assistant secretary, Marquita Walters, who's our current secretary today, to take some of that money and address the way that we handle children in the foster care system. We stabilized a new way of focus. We need to decrease the number of children that are actually in residential care because children are cared for better in families. So we changed that and we also started doing more work on preventing children from coming into foster care by working with their families in their home. Well, this work that started under Governor Blanco actually has, it stuck. Let me illustrate it for you. In December 2005, there were 585 children that were foster children that were placed in residential care. At the time, that was about 12% of about 4,900 children at that, in that month that were in foster care. In September, last month, there were 133 children in residential placements of 4,400 kids in care. That's only 3%. That's good news. And what's on the horizon? the federal government catching up, Governor Blanco. In February of this year, Congress passed the Family First Prevention Services Act. This is the most significant federal child welfare legislation in decades. It has the potential to impact children and families in an enorm in enormous way. It makes substantial changes to federal child welfare financing. You wanna change policy? You change financing. New resources are available. New restrictions on reimbursements are also available. Secretary Walters wanted to be here today, but she is at an event being hosted by the First Lady called Louisiana Fosters. Same time. We now have, again, a governor and First Lady 
First Family, they care about children and families, and they're helping us to uh, strengthen the network and continuum of care we have for our families. So as we move forward, we're going to need the work of this institute and others to help us make good decisions about the Family First Prevention Services Act and how it will impact. We must be using evidence-based practices as we go forward. We've got 500 less child welfare workers than we did in 2005. We've got 500 less child welfare workers than we did in 2005. With more complicated caseloads, an opioid crisis crippling our fragile families, the work is more difficult, more demanding, and more dangerous. DCFS needs an infusion of workers. It needs increased pay and adequate resources to do the work well and to have workers that are well themselves as they deal with the secondary trauma caused by their constant exposure to trauma. I could say more. I should stop because she told me I had one minute. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, Governor, for your leadership. And thank you for having me. Well, I know this for sure without reading any research papers or um, reading any particular uh, papers or documents or statistics that Kathleen Blanco will go down in history as the most extraordinary governor in child welfare policy. I served with many governors before she became governor. I've followed the careers of other governors since she ceased being governor. I've seen in the region many governors, but the changes that she implemented for foster care, adoption, family reunification, understanding and fighting for money policies will go down. And as said, the federal government just passed this major piece of legislation in some measure, measured and modeled after what work had gone on in Louisiana. And to all of our happiness here, our current governor is not only following Governor Blanco's footsteps, but creating new paths with his partnership with Donna Edwards. And so it really is something for our state to be extremely proud of the work that's been done, but really in large measure led and pioneered by Governor Blanco in her time. Let's give our panelists a wonderful round of applause. We do have time for a few questions and comments before we have to break. I want the governor's family to stand up and please be recognized. And can you all introduce yourself? This, the children are here, children. <laughs> Young leaders, go ahead. Pilar Ebley, I'm a daughter. <laughs> and Pilar helped put this whole event together. Pilar, thank you. I'm Monique Boulay, and Pilar actually helped organize the entire policy center. Thank you, Pilar. I'm Carmen Blanco. I'm the oldest daughter. <laughs> I'm Kathleen Boulay, and I'm a granddaughter. Any other? I hate to ask this, because if I ask for cousins, the whole place may, <laughs> may start up. So just wave if you, yes. Yeah, I'm the son-in-law. Okay. <laughs> And while we're introducing my family, can I uh, introduce my husband, Frank Snellings? Yeah. <laughs> Comments or questions? And I thought, yes, in the back. So it's, it's clear that the uh, Blanco Public Policy Center has its work cut out for it. I mean, every single topic that you talk, each of you have talked about could be the focus of the Public Policy Center for years. Um, <laughs> To my mind, there are a couple of things that we didn't really deal with, and maybe these are ideas for improving the future of Colloquia. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Michael Martin, professor of history at UL. Uh, one of my questions or statements is um, all of this requires funding, right? So we're talking about things that cost money backlogs of infrastructure, new staff members, teacher barriers, whatever. Where does that money come from? Uh, in this state. And then I think something that's related to that is how do we get people to care about this stuff? And it seems to me like there is a kind of nonchalance amongst the 
voters, which you see with voter turnout on local and state uh, 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 elections, um, where people just don't seem to, to, to care about it. Um, so I realize that those are two really big questions, and maybe you don't have answers. Well, I'd like to take a shot at one of them, if I could, and excellent questions. But I think that one of the ways to get people to care is to actually tell them the truth, and to begin with. And the truth is, contrary to what most people believe, that progress has been made in so many of these areas, and that government spending with the collaboration of public sector, private sector, faith-based organizations focused on a problem can actually take, and I think you shared, the investments for AIDS and the 29% increase. If people would believe that their collective action really resulted in positive outcomes instead of being told every day of their life, everything's broken, nothing works, you can't believe anyone, fake news, don't read anything, don't listen to anything, and government is bad, well, of course people get, <laughs> you know, like depressed and like, well, what are we going to do? It's all for naught. But think about that as this institute is created, telling the truth, speaking the truth, let science and research lead the way. Talk to people about we can in decrease the suicide rate by 50%. We can decrease the residential care. I don't know if you all know what residential care is, but residential care is care, of course, it's not really family-like. It's people that are paid to raise kids. You just think about yourself. How would you like in a group home to be wake up every morning and know that the people there, and some of these foster homes are fine, but the governor and I know, people are paid uh, to raise raise the children there, not with relatives. It's It's really the least desirable way but you want children to be in families. We've decreased it by what? Residential care by 90%? Right, well, we've gone, um, when we look at that time to now, from 540 something kids to 133 kids. I mean, I mean a it's huge a great decrease. Increase. You know what I'm saying? I think that's one strategy. Are there other strategies that pop to people's minds? And I think the governor is going to come give closing remarks. Any other strategies, real quick? Policy Center has to advocate just for the funding, because the reality is we'll never have enough money to do any of this. The most important thing that the transformative centers are doing are providing reasons for legislators mm -hmm. to make it a priority. So the research for a reason will make it easy to understand why investing in higher education or in child welfare or you know infrastructure is important. And so if we just say, give us more money, we become a another sounding voice in the echo chamber. I'd rather say why the money is important and why spending it on this issue will get more bang for your buck. What's the highest and best use for what limited dollars you have? And that's what we see in justice reform is that um, the way we spend our money can be better spent uh, done in evidence-based approaches that end up costing us a lot less. And a lot of the innovation uh, is funded by the federal government. In fact, the state of Louisiana is underfunded in terms of the lion's share of substance abuse and mental health services grants and Bureau of Justice Assistance grants um, that we're struggling to keep up with now uh, just because of the lack of dedicated resources that can help just get these grants to launch and see them through. And now that we're starting to self-fund a lot of these projects, uh, you know, the innovation through federal dollars, um, you know, that's starting to accumulate and give us some momentum to keep on funding those projects. In fact, we have, you know, $2 million for the state um, through the Department of Criminal Justice already funding some of this um, justice reinvestment initiatives. Um, we have about $7.5 million pending that we should hear any day through the month of September on um, getting those awards. So the, the focus is starting now and getting that momentum. And I think once we start seeing those innovations, seeing how they lead to cost savings, and also positive outcomes for families, for family reunification, um, for people that are giving back in terms of paying taxes, getting well-paid jobs. In, in the uh, reentry program I was talking about, you know, we have some graduates of that program, they're now working as instructors in technical colleges that are making six figures out in the oil fields. These are well 
paying jobs, and in fact, the probation and parole officers are like, wait, <laughs> what about me? They're getting paid almost double, the participants who were just in Angola a year ago. Uh, but providing for their families and giving back to their communities and giving back to the other participants who are currently in the program. And once you get that momentum, that's where it starts. Right. Mm -hmm. Sally, one more. Any other comments or thoughts? Yeah, let's, let's pass this um, microphone down to this gentleman. Um, my name is Stephen Dick. I'm a uh, uh, research scientist at the PCARD Center. Uh, after 12 years at PCARD, I understand how a center like this can be a collection that will provide supportable information for people who are looking to do this. You know, you bring people together, you get that information, and you know a particular location uh, that you can get uh, data-driven research that will support public policy. Uh, and this is where one of the most valuable aspects of this particular center can come. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Brent Bailey. I'm a current student um, at UL Lafayette. And my question is more centered to Dr. Reed and Dr. Kalich. As y'all were speaking, I noticed that y'all talked about mental health. And I had stumbled across a NOLA.com article that discussed the Department of Education receiving funds for mental health recently. And it basically had talked about that the funds would be going to um, local parishes and things of that sort. And I was wondering, as a current college student, how um, are those funds going to be allocated towards um, our mental health? Um, being a minority student at a PWI, um, mental health is a very critical thing. It's one thing getting to college, but it's also another thing to stay in college. So I guess if y'all could best answer, um, what do you know anything about the funds and where they're going to be allocated, and how can a current student um, benefit from them? So I would say, um, first of all, thank you so much, um, Brent, for, for speaking. I think it's important that we have voices to say we need um, support, we need help, we want to make sure that students are supported. I think that was uh, what my colleague here was talking about, this idea of removing stigma. We do see across the country, and certainly in Louisiana, heightened um, demand for mental health support for our students. Um, I haven't heard from my partner, John White, with the Department of Ed, or the Department of Higher Ed, around those resources, but I will say that we are under-resourced when it comes to this issue. We need to make sure we're doing more to support students um, and making sure that students understand that there are places for them to go, that they um, are welcome at our institutions, and how do we support them. So when we look at our students today, we see students who are first in their family, um, that have maybe no college knowledge from their family. We see students who are food insecure, housing insecure. So there are a lot of challenges for our college students. And so I, I really understand that we need to do more. I know Dr. Savoy is, is here from this campus. And I know that campuses are reaching out for grants. They're trying to partner up with other agencies that provide support. And they're trying to make sure that they have healthcare professionals that are well prepared on campus. But I'm happy to visit more with you as I, too, am learning about this work in my new role. I would add, I'm not on mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would add that, ooh, now I'm on mic, sorry. Uh, I would add that, I, although I didn't get into this, the third leading cause of death for African American males is suicide. And that's a tremendous explosion in the rate in recent years. Um, so what you were asking is a really important question, and we just don't have enough research. We need this institute and institutes like it for that exact reason. Um, so thank you for your question. It's important. Well, I think uh, we've had a very powerful session this morning, and I want to thank each and every one of the presenters. And it was such a wide variety of, um, of problems that need to be addressed. And uh, the search for 
the, the vehicles to get to the solutions are very critical. So I see an enormous amount of work for this center from the presenters here today, knowing that there are many, many more problems out there that are just as critical and have great, great needs. Mary touched on something when she said that, um, that we hear too much about government failure. And when I stop to really listen to the noise around us um, through the, the talk media, we have a lot of people just making empty charges. And there's a crisis as a result of that, a crisis of confidence in government. Nobody believes that their tax dollars are being properly spent because they hear that message every day that government is wasting money. And I would ask you that if you looked at your tax dollar um, and understood that it was going to be spent to address any one or maybe part of each of these problems, would you consider that a waste? Or would you consider that a good investment? So I think the center has to address that perception problem also. And in Louisiana, we are truly one of the least tax states, but every citizen out there who is not focused and, and just leading a regular life believes that we are overtaxed because that is another message that they're getting from, that, from those talking voices out there. So, you know, I, I um, think that we had a, a classic opportunity to do an analysis of just how much damage cutting taxes to the extreme has done to this state. Costs do not go away, they just get shifted. Higher education deficits um, that were incurred over the, over the years after I left the governor's office were simply shifted to the students. Universities are necessary and needed to survive. And so tuition went up in, uh, dramatically dramatically. When tuition goes up, there are people who are shut out of an opportunity for a higher education. And I began to really watch that and wonder if that was simply not intentional. I really think it was intentional. That they wanted to educate fewer people and did not want to pay for a properly educated universe of people in Louisiana. Why do you need to invest in other people's education, in, in families who lived on the margins? Why do we need to have that? Because we need a properly educated workforce. And everybody needs to be educated. So we've suffered greatly. We had the great model of cutting, 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 and it drove us into the tank. So now we're in recovery, and recovery is going to be at least as long as the, the damaged years. It's going to take a good while, and it probably will take longer. So how do you get some of this funded? Well, we do get, we can apply to the federal government for grants. Um, you can go to um, uh, private foundations who are interested in some specific endeavor. And uh, there are, you know, then there are individuals in each community who will be affected by some, something that, they've, that they know about here. And they, they may have acquired great wealth and may be able to be, become a sponsor. So there are, there are ways to finding money, uh, but we have to let the people of Louisiana know that there have been some grand successes. Um, people were told to do more with less, and I always said that's about impossible. We all do less with less. You can only stretch your dollars so far, and I'm the master of the stretch dollar. I raised six kids on an educator's salary before I went to work, <laughs> and that was not easy work. It's a lot nicer to have a second income, you know, to help you bridge those gaps. So. You know, those problems are out there. Public perception has to be changed. And I think that I hope to see a Speaker's Bureau 
of caring people for each of these topics to be able to be sent out to speak to every civic club. They're always looking for speakers. Inform people properly. Let them know the realities. Let's speak truth to power instead of just letting these voices out there, just negative, negative, negative voices control our lives. We, we need to confront the negative voices face on. Go on to their radio shows. Go on to their television shows. You know, say, I'm, I'm here. I, I, have a, I have a perspective. Let me talk. And monitor them. You don't have to listen to them because they'll wear you out. But if, if, you, if you just turn it, turn it on for about five minutes every now and then, you will know what the conversation of the month is. And so, you know, if you hear something that triggers you, pick up that phone and call and say, I'd like to offer some uh, other perspective based on my experience, <laughs> you know. There are ways to empower people and, and try to, to change the tone. We've got to get away from this um, tone of, uh, that creates anger and distrust. And maybe the Policy Center can help to do that too. Those are the things I hope to see happening. And I'm going to tell you the one thing I don't want to see. I do not want to see shelves of studies <laughs> <laughs> sitting there uh, getting dust filled. And um, I, I want this to be a place where ideas are pushed out into the community, actively pushed out. And we can do that. We can do that. We have that power. This is going to affect the whole state. And if my visionary... Um, thoughts are going to be accurate, we will affect the nation. And we could even be an international inspiration. So this is the core beginning. My daughter Pilar has really taken this idea and pushed it for us. She works in development here at UL. It needed money, <laughs> you know, to have the center uh, start right off there. And, uh, and I want to thank President Savla because he said, this is a great thing for the university. And before I let you go to lunch, I want to tell you that Mary Landrieu was an absolute, absolutely dedicated partner to create um, the, the right policies and the right atmosphere for a recovery not just for the hurricanes, I mean, she's always been there, but it was during that hurricane recovery period that she literally shined. She knew how to cross lines, partisan lines. Those partisan political lines never interfered with Mary's dedication. And the other thing that I just deeply admired about her is we had another senator who, every time we had a discussion, brought the negatives to, the, oh, we can't do that, um, they won't go along with that, you know, and Mary, stand up and just about jump down anyone's th anybody who said things like that she would jump down their throats and she'd say we're going to do it because we need it because we have to do it or we won't have a recovery and then she would just get in there and and <laughs> leave them standing in the dust and go out and do it and so many of the things that I get credited for because I said Mary we need to do this she was actually the person getting them done, and I want to give her a thousand points of credit. So, um, thank you so much. I think it's just been a wonderful morning. I appreciate all of you.